In this video, we will be discussing about the drugs used for type 2 diabetes mellitus, <coughs> excluding insulin. Now, before we go into the drugs, <coughs> let us try to understand the normal regulation of blood glucose in a normal glycemic patient. So, as you can see, this is uh, the gastrointestinal tract of a normal glycemic patient. Let us assume that this patient has a high glucose intake meal. Now you can see that the gut is full of glucose and this glucose gets absorbed into the circulatory system. And the circulatory system is going to circulate this glucose all over the body including the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas. Now these beta cells contain an enzyme called glucokinase which is going to convert glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. And glucose 6-phosphate enters glycolysis and it generates ATP. Now, it is worth remembering that the beta cells of the pancreas contain constitutively open potassium channels. And these potassium channels allow potassium to enter the beta cells um, from the plasma. And this contributes to the voltage of the cell. When the patient takes a glucose-rich meal, ATP is generated and this ATP can block the constitutively open potassium channels and prevent the further entry of potassium. When this happens, the voltage of the cell changes, the, the, the cell gets depolarized. And when the voltage of this cell changes, voltage-sensitive calcium channels open and this causes the release of preformed insulin that has been stored in storage vesicles. It results in the release of this preformed insulin into the plasma. Now, at this point, it is worth remembering that in response to an oral glucose load, the uh, endocrine cells in the small intestine release certain hormones called incretins. And these incretins can also stimulate the release of insulin, preformed insulin from the beta cells of the pancreas into the blood. So now we have a situation where the plasma is rich in not only glucose but also insulin. Now it is the job of insulin to ensure that the glucose moves from the plasma into the cells which require glucose for the generation of ATP. Now this is achieved by the binding of insulin to its receptors. So let us take a closer look at how this happens. Now the receptor for insulin is an example for RTKs or receptor tyrosine kinases. Now these are receptors with, with an extracellular domain, a transmembrane domain and an intracellular domain. Now these receptors obviously exist as dimers. Now, the intracellular domain of these receptors have got both a structural role, that is they form part of the receptor, and they have got a functional role as well. The function that is played by these intracellular portions uh, is that they have tyrosine kinase activity. They function as enzymes as well. So, we uh, need to remember that these receptors are proteins and are therefore polymers of amino acids. If we were to represent one of those amino acids here, this would be how it would look. We are going to represent the amino acid tyrosine, just the amino acid tyrosine. We are going to ignore all other amino acids and represent only tyrosine. Okay, now, when insulin comes and binds to this receptor, the tyrosine kinase activity of these receptors become active and they cause phosphorylation of the tyrosine residues, their own tyrosine residues. And this process is called autophosphorylation. Now when this happens, certain proteins, certain intracellular proteins get activated and they manage to attach or dock at these um, uh, these points. When they dock at these points, at the tyrosine residues, they get activated. 
and they can send signals to the nucleus where genes are present, resulting in the transcription and translation of genes, resulting in the formation of various proteins. Now one of these proteins happen to be the glucose transporters. And when these glucose transporters get upregulated, glucose moves from the plasma into the cell, thereby lowering the plasma glucose. So this would be how it would look in the broader picture. So this is how <clears throat> plasma glucose is uh, regulated in a normal glycemic patient. Now what happens in a patient with type 2 diabetes mellitus? Well in a patient with type 2 diabetes mellitus, almost everything remains the same up to the point of the insulin receptor. Now in type 2 diabetes mellitus, uh, there is probably something wrong with the insulin receptor or the intracellular proteins which bind to the receptor or with the genes themselves. Uh, the net result is that the number of proteins which get translated are less and therefore the activity of insulin becomes less. So the amount of glucose that moves from the plasma into the cell is less, more amount of glucose remains in the blood. The patient develops hyperglycemia and when this becomes long-standing, the patient develops diabetes mellitus. So there is a resistance to the activity of insulin and this is the central pathology in type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uh, the central pathology is insulin resistance or a fall in insulin sensitivity. This is what happens initially during the first few years of diabetes, but um, we need to remember that diabetes mellitus is a progressive disease and in the years to come, we can expect beta cell failure to occur as well. All right, so now we are in a position to discuss the drugs used in uh, the treatment of type 2 diabetes mellitus, excluding insulin of course. So. If we were to look at the first target, namely the brush border of the intestinal epithelium, we can see that these cells produce an enzyme known as alpha-glucosidase. Normally, this enzyme is responsible for breaking down uh, more complex sugars like starch, dextrin, disaccharides and so on into smaller, more easily absorbed sugars. If we block this enzyme, these sugars fail to get absorbed. And that is exactly the mechanism of alpha glucosidase inhibitors, the examples of which include acarbose, voglibose, and miglitol. These drugs are quite safe. They can produce some distressing flatulence, diarrhea, and abdominal bloating that can be very distressing to the patient. Um, this can be reduced or minimized by administering the drug with meals and these adverse effects generally wane uh, when given long term. Right, next we spoke about hormones released by endocrine cells of the intestine in response to an oral glucose load and we said that these hormones are called incretins. They, st they bind to their receptors in the beta cells in the pancreas and stimulate the pancreas to release more insulin into the blood. Right. So, an example for an incretin would be glucagon like peptide 1 or GLP-1. And uh, normally, GLP-1 is degraded by the enzyme dipeptidylpeptidase 4 or DPP-4. Now based on this uh, concept, two types of drugs have been developed. The first being DPP-4 resistant GLP-1 receptor agonists and secondly DPP-4 inhibitors. Now let us take a closer look at the DPP-4 resistant GLP-1 receptor agonists. The most important thing to note about these drugs are that they are generally not orally administered they are injectables. Current evidence seems to show that GLP-1 receptor agonists have a lower risk of hypoglycemia when, con when compared with insulin and it has got a beneficial effect on body weight when compared to insulin. They cause weight loss.
The examples include dulaglutide, albiglutide, liraglutide, lixisanatide, and exanatide. Now, all these drugs are injectables. There is one example of an orally administered GLP-1 receptor agonist, and that drug is semaglutide. Now, three GLP-1 receptor agonists have been found to, ha to possess independently uh, additional cardiovascular benefit and these include liraglutide, semaglutide and dulaglutide. These drugs have adverse effects. In fact, up to half of the patients who take this drug will have distressing nausea, uh, but this adverse effect wanes off with time. Two other more uh, critical potential adverse effects include the development of carcinoma thyroid, an adverse effect that has been noticed in animal experiments, as well as the development of pancreatitis. So patients who are at risk of developing these diseases should not be administered GLP-1 receptor agonists. Next we move on to the DPP-4 inhibitors. These drugs result in an increased insulin secretion and a decreased glucagon production. The examples for these drugs include cetagliptin, saxagliptin, allogliptin, linagliptin, and vildagliptin. And cetagliptin happens to be the prototype drug in this group. Okay, so um, the next group of drugs that we need to discuss are drugs that can modulate the activity of potassium channels in the beta cell of the pancreas. So these are the drugs that can block the constitutively open potassium channels, cause a change in the voltage of the cell, causing voltage sensitive calcium channels to open and stimulate the release of insulin, preformed insulin from the beta cell of the pancreas into the blood. So there are two forms of potassium channel modulators. They include the sulfonyl ureas and meglitinide analogs. We discussed the mechanism of action of sulfonyl ureas. They block the constitutively open potassium channels. Now, a significant number of patients who respond initially to the sulfonyl ureas will later cease to respond. And this is called secondary failure and is generally due to progression of beta cell failure in type 2 diabetes mellitus patients. The older sulfonyl urea especially can cause hypoglycemia and weight gain of up to 3 kilograms may be noted in patients who uh, take sulfonyl ureas. The examples include gliburide, also called glybenglamide, glypicide and glymipiride. The meglitinide analogs are very similar to the sulfonyl ureas. They include nataglinide and repaglinide. Okay, so up to this point, we have discussed about the alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, the DPP-4 inhibitors, sulfonyl ureas, and meglitinide analogs. Excluding the alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, all the other drugs stimulate the beta cells of the pancreas to release more insulin and therefore they are called insulin secretagogues. Yeah, so we have discussed alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, DPP-4 inhibitors, the potassium channel modulators, namely the sulfonyl ureas and meglitinide analogs. Now, we move on to the next group of drugs. Now, there is a receptor which resides in the nucleus of almost all cells in the body. And the name of this receptor is the PPAR gamma receptor, the peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma. Now when this receptor is stimulated, it reduces insulin resistance, or in other words, it increases insulin sensitivity. There is increased translation of proteins, including the glucose transporters resulting in a reduction in plasma glucose. Right, these drugs are also called thiazolidindions. PPAR gamma agonists are also called thiazolidindions, the examples of which include pioglitazone and rosiglitazone.
Now these drugs are called, they are not called insulin secretagogues, they are called insulin sensitizers. Uh, and as mentioned, the examples include pioglitazone and rosiglitazone. Now, these drugs have got adverse effects, unfortunately, and they include the development of congestive cardiac failure, weight gain, and an increased risk of fractures. Right. Okay, so now we move on to the next group of drugs, namely the AMP kinase activators. Now, most cells in the body will contain an enzyme called AMP kinase. And when this enzyme is stimulated, it results in a decrease in gluconeogenesis, especially in the liver. And this results in a decreased hepatic glucose production. So this is exactly the mechanism of action of drugs which stimulate AMP kinase, namely the biguanides, the most important example of which is metformin. Metformin is a very safe drug and it causes mild weight loss and therefore it is no surprise that it is considered a first-line drug in the treatment of type 2 diabetes mellitus. It is currently the most commonly administered drug for this indication. Right, so the next group of drugs are the SGLT2 inhibitors. Let us consider this to be um, a nephron with the Bowman's capsule and the proximal convoluted tubule. Here is an epithelial cell that lines the proximal convoluted tubule and here is a blood vessel. On the luminal aspect of this epithelial cell is a transporter called the SGLT2 transporter, the sodium glucose transporter 2. It is a symporter and it is responsible for the movement of sodium and glucose from the lumen of the uh, of the nephron into the epithelial cell and consequently to the blood. Now this transporter is trans responsible for the reabsorption of up to 90% of uh, filtered sugar from the nephron and so if you manage to block this transporter all this sugar gets lost in the urine. Now this is the mechanism of action of SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, the examples include dapagliflozin, empagliflozin and canagliflozin. Um, it is quite predictable that the adverse effect of this drug would be urinary tract infections. Um, there are other adverse effects like an increased risk of fractures. Interestingly, canagliflozin is, uh, it is a drug that can increase the risk of uh, amputation of the lower limbs and therefore is probably best avoided in patients who are at risk of developing diabetic foot. Other drugs which can uh, be used in type 2 diabetes mellitus other than insulin include pramlantide, bromocryptin, the bile acid sequestrant cholecephalam and so on. These are not commonly used drugs. So this would be in brief the drugs used in type 2 diabetes mellitus other than insulin.